Thanks, Ryan. So when we hear stories in the news of somebody's bravery, the first thing they usually say when they're interviewed afterwards is that they just did what anybody else would have done, or they didn't think, they just acted. Bravery is rarely a conscious choice. But I don't think it's just in those more newsworthy, life-threatening situations when that kind of courage can and should come into play. When we look at successful people in our lives, it's very easy to judge our journey against their destination, to assume that we could never achieve anything as impressive or reach the heights that they've reached. And I think that's never more true than in creative fields, and particularly in the video games industry. Arguably the ultimate combination of creative freedom, but with technological restraint. Now, it may now be a multi-billion dollar industry, but it started from very humble roots. Teenagers in bedrooms with big ideas, but with little understanding of how they would go on to change the world. Even here in Sleepy Silicon Spa, some of our local developers have brought some of the world's largest interactive franchises to life and been hugely successful doing so. I've had nearly 25 years in the games industry, all of it here in Leamington, and the changes in that time have been incredible to see. But I want to take it back to the beginning of that story and try and appreciate, with over three decades of hindsight, that pluck displayed by some of our early industry pioneers, and also maybe start to appreciate how much it still inspires so many of us forging our own path in the industry today. So I want to share with you two stories that are separated by over three decades, but intrinsically linked. And I think they go some way to answering that question of, of perhaps what we can take from those teenage trailblazers and what they did in the early 80s. So in the very early 80s, two pairs of teenage brothers began experimenting with the new home computers. The Darling Brothers and the Oliver Twins would go on to form two of the UK's and the world's most respected and successful games companies, Codemasters and Blitz Game Studios, building the foundations at the same time of the Leamington Spa Games Cluster. Fast forward nearly 30 years, and early 2013 saw the start of the Backspace journey. What began as a simple idea to tell that 30-year heritage of Silicon Spa soon became a multi-event award-winning festival that brought that story bang up to date, showcased the very latest things happening in the town and the region, and also hopefully inspired the next generation too. But how do, we, how do we take that inspiration and actually turn it into something that we can use and move forward on? Um, I think when you're confronted with a blank page, uh, an open sandbox to explore creatively, it can sometimes be really intimidating to even know how to start. So I want to talk about three techniques that I think can help make that process easier. They may be trite, but they're things that I'm passionate about, and I know that they work. But before we start, I've got a bit of a confession to make. The first one of these is one that I'm really, really bad at. But it's OK, because I know I'm not the only one, and I know it can be beaten. So this idea of analysis paralysis, this kind of fear of, of what you're about to start, of overthinking things to the nth degree so that you, you're terrified to even take the first step along the road. It's something that I'm sure most of us can identify with. We've all done it at some point in our lives, even when we're contemplating our least important decisions. But as the little green guy says, it really is impossible to predict the future, so it's really not worth expending all that energy on it. I heard a brilliant quote from Michael J. Fox only a few weeks ago, um, where he was talking about how he discusses his battle with Parkinson's disease with his children. And he says to them, that if you spend time stressing about the worst case scenario, and then it happens, you've lived through it twice, so why would you put yourself through that? Now, I know that anybody that knows me well will be raising a wry smile right now, because I can overthink things to an Olympic standard. I'm really very good at it, and I'm very good at making myself stressed into the process. Interestingly, this last week's been quite a good example of that. <laughs> but I also know that the times that I felt most fulfilled, most proud of my accomplishments, and most surprised by my own abilities are the occasions when I've parked that natural urge to overthink things, and I've just got stuck in. For me, backspace was one of those moments. Began as the brainchild of a local creative director, Craig Spivey, and it started with this simple idea to inject a contemporary edge into a local heritage festival. Craig had managed to um, amass a small pot of local government funding to help put the exhibition on, 
and he started assembling a team in early 2013. And that's where I came in. <coughs> February that year, I received a LinkedIn request asking if perhaps I might be interested in helping curate the exhibition um, and maybe making some introductions to the local games industry. So far, so simple. Only within the first couple of hours of us meeting to discuss the project, we got a little bit carried away. Um, and we managed to turn it into a, frankly, crazily ambitious series of events and activities um, that would take this story and, and bring it up to date and do a whole load of other wild things with it. But we both got so passionate about the potential of it so quickly that it didn't really occur to either of us to not try and make all of that plan happen, even though from the date of that meeting to the date of the exhibition opening was a little over two and a half months. Now, what I should probably have done was a detailed SWOT analysis of the potential work involved and the opportunities and the, the effort that it would take. But I think if I'd done that, I probably wouldn't have agreed to get involved. And I'm really, really glad that passion won out. And I don't regret accepting that LinkedIn request for a moment. If nothing else, it introduced me to someone who I'm now pleased to say is one of my best friends. Now, as we started to research our epic 30-year timeline that was on the wall in the exhibition, it quickly became apparent that several of our main protagonists in that story had gone through a similar journey of perhaps blind faith over reason that we were going through. Take the Oliver Twins, for example. They got started experimenting with their older brothers, Sinclair Spectrum, in the early 80s, and they were hooked instantly. They threw themselves into learning as much as they could, working out what they could get out of the machine. They even took on a paper round to get a bigger and better machine. And this is pre-internet and pre-games industry, really, so they had nowhere to go for help or advice. They literally were blazing a trail on their own. But in 1984, they got their first big break when they entered and won a Saturday morning kids' TV show competition to design a video game. Now, they could have taken the easy route, and actually the route that every other entrant took of designing their idea on paper and posting it in, but no, they decided that the best way to show their passion and the design idea they'd come up with was to actually just leap straight in and code a fully working game and send it in on cassette. For those of you in the audience old enough to remember cassettes. Now, it didn't occur to them to do it any other way, really, um, even though you know, they could easily have kind of got worried about whether that was what was expected or you know, how, even whether the TV production company had a machine to play the game on. But they just followed their vision and they went for it. That kick-started their early commercial success, and they started to make a modest name for themselves in this growing industry. They even managed to convince their dad a year or so later, who it was wonderful to show around the exhibition 30 years after that, to let them delay going to university for a year while they tried to make it as programmers. Now, I imagine that their dad thought it was considerably braver than they did at the time, um, but I think that, that desire to follow your passions and your dreams, even if you've got no possible way of knowing whether it's going to be a, successful, a success or not, is one that we should perhaps all follow more as creatives and, I suspect, as parents as well. I think no one explains that power of just getting stuck in better than the Pixar president, Ed Catmull, in his excellent book, Creativity, Inc. If you put your faith in slow, deliberative planning in the hopes that it will spare you failure down the line, well, you're deluding yourself. If your primary goal is to have a fully worked out, set in stone plan, then you're only setting yourself up to be unoriginal. But I also think that it's not just about making yourself successful and seeing your own plan, plans come to fruition. I think it's equally important to, to display kind of perhaps a little bit more bravery in sacrificing some of that personal kudos and collaborating with other people to make something that's perhaps more than the sum of its parts, or even going that step further and empowering other people to create something bigger than bet and better than anything you've achieved. Game development now is a team sport for a reason, and it's not just because the workload's massive, although it is. Games are now bigger and better and more engaging than they've ever been before, simply because of the diversity of people involved in their creation and inception. Now, as an industry, we really must work much harder to improve that diversity further. But nobody who has worked with a professional development team can deny that shared passion and that shared drive to spur each other on to even greater creative expression. It's an intoxicating mix. Now, around about the same time that the Olivers were getting started, so were our other pair of teenage brothers in rural Warwickshire, the Darlings. 
They were a little bit further along the line, and they were already starting to see the benefits of collaborating with others, building a roster of developers around themselves, helping to publish their games and get them the recognition that they deserved. In 1985, their paths crossed with the Oliver Twins for the first time at the Electronic Computer Trade Show at Olympia in London. They hit it off straight away, and within a month, the Oliver's first game for Co-Masters was released, Super Robin Hood. This was good graphics in 1985, by the way. <laughs> it shot straight to number one, and a collaboration that would define much of the first couple of decades of the UK games industry was born. Now, the, by the following year, nearly 14% of all games sold in the UK came out of the Co-Masters stable, half of those from the Oliver Twins. They were hugely successful and influential. And many people have, have said over the years that perhaps neither pair of brothers would have been quite as successful without the others, and I think that's perhaps true. But I'd also argue that each of the four of them individually maybe might not have been quite as successful had they not started that teenage journey working with a sibling. Working with family can be an interesting and challenging thing at times, and I met my own husband in the workplace. But I think what we can really learn from it is that enforced staying power that comes from working with a family member or a partner, that idea that when you hit the inevitable bumps in the road or you have the disagreements or things don't go the way you want them to, that ability to step back and see what's really important and why you got together in the first place on this project, it's something that is forced on you when you're working with family. Because if you're sharing a teenage bedroom or you're getting up the next morning and having breakfast together, it puts a different perspective on those workplace battles. And for the Olivers, it also provided an unexpected benefit too. Super Robin Hood was one of the first games in the world to include voice synthesis when their mum stepped up to take on the role of Maid Marian. So you're never quite sure what benefits you're going to get from working with family. When it came to Backspace, we knew that collaboration was going to be absolutely vital if we were going to have a chance of pulling off our crazily ambitious plans. But what we couldn't have anticipated was how quickly the local industry and community jumped on board too. <laughs> um, it almost seemed like the time was right, and I think sharing our passion up front really helped that. The larger, more established studios in the area spent many hours rummaging through lofts and archives to give us interesting things to display. And the smaller, newer studios put loads of time into organizing social fundraising events to help us raise money for our chosen charities. The local council really stepped up as well. The public sector really played its part. They managed to find us a free, empty retail unit for two weeks so our exhibition could have a home and so that some of our events could have an interesting venue. They also lined up six diverse retailers across town for our Sparkade Trail, custom-built arcade cabinets, and there's a couple of them here today if you want to check them out, that could allow us to showcase the very latest and best games coming out of the region. Now, if any one of those cogs had not worked properly, the whole machine would have ground to a halt. But like I said, that, that desire to share our passion up front and being humble enough to ask for help is what really helped make the first year of Backspace a resounding success. We welcomed over 10,000 people through the door, seeing a dozen different events, plus the exhibition. <laughs> we weren't, they weren't allowed to stay. <laughs> we raised over 1,200 pounds for our chosen charities. And we even managed to secure six national award nominations, winning gold at that year's festival. But again, that power of sharing our vision up front, and not just being willing to collaborate, but actively willing to share the glory as well, that's what really made this possible. Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield explains that power really well. Real leadership is not about glorious crowning acts. It's not enough to shelve your own competitive streak. You have to try consciously to help others succeed. Lay the groundwork for their success, then step back and let it shine. But it's also important to kind of carry that torch on and allow future generations to shine as well. Our Codemasters and Blitz's successes over the years could easily be measured in conventional commercial terms, but both companies could take enormous pride from the efforts they went to to help the next generation of game developers too. Whether that was running mentoring programs, advising on university course content, hosting student open days. Blitz even had its own award-winning education outreach team that was run out of my department during my time at Blitz. And that was the reason I was so passionate from the beginning of my involvement with Backspace, to make sure that we supported our local students in the same way too. So that's exactly what we did. 
We stage careers panel evenings, one the first year, five right across the county the second year. We put on programming workshops that attracted people of all ages, a whole day's worth the first year, two whole days the second. We even involved some of our younger visitors with character design challenges. But the second year, we really stepped it up another level when we launched the school's game design competition. We piloted it at a local school, Bishop's Tatchbrook Primary, and we were blown away by how enthusiastically they all leapt on board. The head teacher was really keen to embrace the recent changes to the ICT curriculum, and the staff put um, teams together that really encouraged collaboration at its best. They were mixed sex, mixed age, mixed ability, mixed confidence level, mixed experience. It was an incredibly inspiring day. We took over two thirds of the school aside, took the whole school day out um, to work on these amazing design ideas. Couldn't believe the results that came out of them. I just was astonished at the level of detail and creativity and ingenuity that came out of those few hours. We showcased some of them at a special design studio at the exhibition that year, and they even appeared on BBC News briefly. But the real legacy of that day didn't come home to me for many months. This young man's name is Isaac, or Izzy to his friends. In July 2015, he wrote to his head teacher and thanked him for allowing the school to take part in the Backspace game design competition. He said that the inspirational highlight of his entire final year at primary school had been his winning team's visit to Radiant Worlds, the Oliver Twins' new studio. That visit was hosted by myself and Philip Oliver, and together we shared our joint passion for the industry and our excitement for its future potential. US journalist Sidney J. Harris once memorably said, the whole purpose of education is to turn mirrors into windows. If we open just a few windows that day by paying our passion forward, then it was well worth the effort. I hope that Izzy will be brave enough to follow his dreams in the future, whether they end up being inspired by his involvement with Backspace or by something else entirely. He's an accomplished musician as well, by the way. But regardless of that, I know that Backspace inspired me to follow my own journey. My own business was born right alongside the first festival. And now, two and a half years on, I still can't quite believe where I've gone and the journey that's, that I followed in that time and what I've managed to achieve. But more than that, I'm incredibly proud now to have the opportunity to be working with the next wave of plucky young startups and new independent developers to help them find their future success too. Now, neither the Darlings or the Olivers or any of us on the Backspace team could possibly have predicted any of these moments and we certainly couldn't have planned for them. But at the end of the day, real success isn't about excessive planning. It's not even about luck. It's about spotting the potential in those serendipitous moments and then having the courage to pursue them. So whether your journey is one that will last several decades or just a few months, it's what you do along the way that's really important and not just what you do on day one. I was 42 before Backspace happened, but I know for certain that my life and my career would be in a very different place right now had I never accepted that LinkedIn request. So I urge you all to not let uncertain outcomes stop you from following opportunities that come your way, regardless of what form they take. Don't try and predict the future. Make sure you take people with you on the journey. And make sure you tell stories that others continue to tell when you've moved on. After all, it's not the time that matters, it's the person. Thank you.